dear God. Hi. You are? My name is Sam. Sam Parson? Yes. The NADH to NAD plus ratio, and finally the acetyl coenzyme to CoA ratio. That's correct. Thank you. So I'm in it to you? Not yet. which is E1, dihydrolipoacyl, transacetylase, which is E2, and dihydrolipoyl, dehydrogenase, which is E3. So, how is it structured, really? How many copies of each component are there? Well, the inner core is the isothelial structure, okay? And the, there are 30 copies of E1, 60 copies of E2, and 12 copies of E3, right? There are also 12 copies of a binding protein, the E3 binding protein. This links the E2 and E3 components. And I know this reaction is highly favored thermodynamically, so regulation is essential. This is referred to as the irreversible commensal metabolic stuff. 
Exactly, because although glucose can be formed from pyruvate, acetyl-CoA cannot be used to form glucose. This is an irreversible step in animals, and therefore it commits the pyruvate to oxidation. Pretty good! Yay! Hello girls, you remember me? I am Sam the Inhibitor. I will be the mastermind that destroys your precious PDH complex and will bring down your- Oh, that's Sam! I remember him! Well, if his name is Sam the Inhibitor, then obviously he's going to inhibit something. Rule holy PDH complex. Those girls. They will pay for humiliating me, and I have the perfect genius plan. Master, but how? You fool! The enzyme league are the very scum of this planet. They are the guardians of the PDH complex, and destroying it is how I shall exact my revenge. Now, let's get to work! Oh my, oh my god. god, what are we gonna do? I'm so gonna hide my tears, so. Minions, the E1 component can be inhibited, and this is done by regulation of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation of E1. Master, what does that mean exactly? Well, simply, the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinesis catalyzes the phosphorylation of the serine residues of E1. The ATP, which is used to yield TPP, is used as a source of phosphate, thereby inhibiting the PDH complex. <laughs> Furthermore, the kinases, which are activated by NADH and acetyl-CoA, which are products of the PDH complex reaction. Furthermore, the kinases, which are activated by NADH and acetyl-CoA, which are products of the PDH complex reaction. So what happens when that intermediate swings to the E2 complex? Well, this, the E2, Sulfide bond, which is reduced to accept the acetyl coa through a tyro ester bond, right? An acetyl dihydrolipyl intermediate is formed and the TPP is released. 
This is attacked by nucleophilic sulfur that's attached to the CoA and um, the dihydrolipo A is released. The E2 component can be inhibited by an increase in acetyl-CoA to CoA ratio. This is so because acetyl-CoA competes with coenzyme A for binding to the E2. This is referred to as product inhibition. That was fairly easy to understand, Master. But wait, there's one more, the E3. Now, at this point, acetyl-CoA is made and it is ready for further oxidation in the citric acid cycle. However, enzymes must always be regenerated into its original form. But why is that? Um, so they can repeat their catalyzed reactions. This is where E3 comes in. It reoxidizes the lipoamide prostatic group on E2. It reoxidizes this. But how does it do that? Okay, so it does this by E3's coenzyme, flavine adenine dinucleotide, uh, also known as FAD. This has an isovaloxane ring which is able to pull hydrogens together. So it oxidizes the lipoamide group into disulfide, right? So it removes these, removes these H hydrogens here and you produce. FADH2. FADH2. And FADH2 is an important intermediate in the final step. Finally, wait. <laughs> FADH2 now needs to go back to FAD. And this is done by NAD. And NAD is oxidized to. NADH and H plus and this floats off into solution but remember NADH is reduced in power therefore it can be used later on in the oxidative phosphorylation step to produce ATP so therefore this reaction is an energy generating metabolic step and guess what it can be inhibited too. Really? How is that? Like E2 inhibition, E3 is inhibited by the same product inhibition. The NADH competes with NAD plus for binding to the E3 component. Increasing this NADH to NAD plus ratio will inhibit the enzyme. Isn't my plan flawless? Guys, don't forget about substrate channeling. What is that again? Substrate channeling is the process of transfer of an intermediate between two active sites of an enzyme that in a sequential reaction in a biosynthetic pathway. In the PDH complex, this occurs on different components. Okay, so the substrate is attached to the flexible arm on the component E2. This flexible arm is long enough that it can swing back and forth between enzyme 1 and enzyme 3. As a result, the lipoic acid moves it to the enzyme 1 site where it accepts two carbon units. These carbon units are then transferred back into the E2 active site. The acetyl group can be transesterified to CoASH. Finally, it swings back into the E3 site. And the sulfhydryl groups are reoxidized to disulfide. Yes, so basically the long flexible arm is effective because it allows the lipoamide functional group to swing back and forth between enzyme 1 and enzyme 3. Are there advantages to substrate channeling then? 
Yes, it has been proposed to decrease the transit time in intermediates, to prevent the loss of intermediates by diffusion, to protect liable intermediates from solvent, and also forestall the entrance of intermediates into competing metabolic pathways. Well, if this is the case, and this is what Sam Hibbert is going to do, we're going to have to hide those pH complex. And I know the perfect place. But sir, if you destroy the complex, would you die as well? We'll cross that bridge when we come to it.